Greetings, I believe in this package is a Forstex X26, not a unit I've looked at before, I suspect that it's the GEC cassette player that I've covered a bit that's in it, um, but we're going to open it up, have a look. The person I bought it from says the cassette player is not working, but I think the mixer is, so I'll test all that as we go along, let's get started. <laughs> Okay, so looks complete. Can't see any missing knobs, anything like that. The next thing to do is to figure out where the screws are on the back. I'm gonna put down a cushion so I don't damage anything on the front. I mean, often from experience, it is a longer one in the middle. So we've got this uh, smooth flange and then this longer threaded area. Whereas this one at the side is shorter, so I suspect that the other three are the same. So for your reference, I'll put a different colour of tape here to show it's a different kind of screw. I'm trying to figure out whether these knobs are what is keeping this side of the unit from coming up. So I'm just going to remove those now. I guess I'm going to have to refer to my own footage to remember what colour of knob goes where. Seems to be white along the top for the auxiliary, then green for the pan, grey for the gain, black for the rest. One little switch there I missed. Okay, that's coming away now. I just took this out of there, plug here, plug here. That's separate now. All kind of familiar looking if you've seen a few of mine few of my videos. This looks like it's the variation on the GEC transport. We've got a shallower record playback head, so I guess that's a little bit of a cost-saving thing. Only thing that looks slightly different up here is that uh, we've got this, I'm not sure what that is, is that a voltage regulator? But anyway, it's using the chassis of the cassette player as a heat sink, so I'll need to be careful removing that. Looks like it's thermal paste or something under there. Doesn't conduct electricity, but does conduct heat that's dissipating the heat on that chip. So, you know, I've looked at this kind of cassette player a couple of times, so I'm sort of familiar with where the screws are. This really reminds me of where they're located on an X15. Yeah, so that's kind of loose now. I just need to watch how this little daughter board up here is connected. Figure out where these cables are connected together. That looks like it's soldered at both ends. Does this come up though? Yeah. Another screw here. Okay. So I need to see where these heads are connected. It looks like they're connected under here. So maybe this board needs to come up before I can disconnect it. Yeah. So a bit of shielding there. Try and be a little bit careful with these wires. They look a little bit delicate. Uh, it's, uh, there's a cable tie in here. Okay, that's lifting up now. Look, look how loose that is. I mean, that belt is fucked. That'll be why it's not working. You know, this is tighter, but really loose. Interesting because it's a thinner belt. Like often when we see this kind it's a thicker belt on here, but yeah, I mean, that's pretty much a GEC transport. Very similar anyway, it's a variation of it. I'll get in here and uh, change these belts. I'm just gonna try and unscrew this to see if I can get, basically because this wire's soldered in at both ends and I really want to have this separate to change the belts. What I'm seeing there is heat paste. Um, I'll need to replace that. So when I replace that, what I use is the kind of compound that you would use to attach the CPU. You can buy that pretty cheap in a bit. I'll uh, wipe that away properly and then I'll replace it when I reattach that. Um, but at that point, okay, we've got one plug here going over there, I guess. That's maybe leaf switches, you know, so when uh, you press these buttons, things close and, you know, it operates. It closes transistors over here, so I think that's the leaf switches. But we basically got... These are the plugs that go to the heads, so it's sending the musical signal to here. 
um, very much because of the colour coding looks like the input for the motor there is coming in through that plug but this one is probably switches and controls I mean I'm guessing but that is now detached main unit so I can start looking at, at replacing belt so we've got one belt here that's for the for the counter uh, we had this really sticky one that's the main drive between this motor and the flywheel so that's turning the caps down which is basically drawing the tape across the heads at steady speed and then there was one going from the pulley on the capstan over here and uh, yeah we've seen that before that's the real mechanism so really that's controlling turning these fast forward and then rewind um, but it also in playback this needs to be going fast enough so we don't get a build up of tape here so I need to find one two three belts I have these uh, square section ones in assorted packs that I buy from Amazon here mixed reports about how well those work but for me so far so good um, it seems to be working okay so I'll just uh, go into my box of belts and try and find some appropriate sizes at the moment I'm taking some Super 10 that's an electrical contact cleaner and I'm putting it through all these agitating it picking up the excess with q-tips this will actually a strong uh, chemical so it's capable of destroying some of the lubricant that was put into these at the factory so once i have blown that out you could use compressed air but i'm using this uh, inflator for a camp head adapted the final step will be to put some kind of electrical uh, lubricant into there uh, there's various options service will make a fader grease that you could use this stuff deoxit is expensive but i think it's good because it's got this needle applicator it's worked really well for me although it says fader on it in fact i use it for pots and i use it for switches so yeah various plastic parts i've got a little dish i've got some windex on there not necessarily easy to get hold of in the united kingdom but i can order it from amazon but on a tip from a viewer that does seem to be the most effective in getting all the crud off of here and i think you can see the windex that's run off it it's pretty brown there may be some discolouring on this plastic just from sunlight. I understand that like putting some uh, peroxide on there and leaving it in the sunlight can mitigate that if you want to do what's called retrobrighting. I'm probably not going to go to that length. It's like not that high end of Porter Studio. I'll be selling it on eventually and I don't know if it's really worth that much more money to me. Um, I just like to wear that's an option. So once that's been sort of sitting and cleaning for a while rinse it through a sieve let it dry if there's any like liquid caught up in here i'll get it off with q-tips before i put it back onto the machine at the end this upper case has also been cleaned with windex it's looking a bit shinier now uh, what i'm about to do now as a precaution is um all of these one two three four five six quarter inch jack sockets and what have we got one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven different rca sockets they're mounted directly onto this uh, circuit board so what can happen is the the pressure of inserting and removing cables from there puts pressure on these little solder tips so what i'm going to do is heat up my soldering iron and introduce a little bit of fresh solder now it's going to take a little bit of time i haven't actually established that there's any problems here any dry joints but it's a small amount of due diligence time that may pay dividends in terms of saving me from a headache later on so i'm going to do it anyway okay so i've put these two belts on and they seem kind of tight enough having worked on this stuff quite a lot that feels like about the right amount of tension. Is that one slipping? I suppose that one could actually be tighter. Let's see if we've got a tighter one. See what I mean? I'm sort of eyeballing the circumference. Um, maybe this is a better fit. Yeah, I suppose what I'm looking for is that when this, this one turns, the one below it turns. Uh, I mean, it's partly a matter of having, sorry, it's not on screen, having these on straight. Okay, so I mean, you can see that as I turn this uh, flywheel, this because this is also connected via this belt, the other one turns. So, I mean, I'm relatively satisfied with that. Um, it would be great if Frostex and Yamaha and Tascam as companies were still selling appropriate belt sets for these, so we definitely knew we had the right length and everything, but unfortunately, that's that's not the case. 
you know, I'm in the position where really I buy these multi sets. I try and find one that's about the right length. I put this back in and see how it goes. And if it stops working properly, well, that's a pain in the neck. But then I, I try and find, you know, if it's slipping, I try and find a, um, a shorter bill. So the tension's higher, so it works properly. Um, but yeah, that's just kind of the way things are at the moment. One of the comments I get from people watching these videos, one of the main sort of sources of frustration is that I seem to be so vague about belt sizes, but I'm trying to explain the reasons why. I think that's about a millimetre, a millimetre, 0.5 across uh, the folded length. I mean, again, this is rough. Maybe 120 centimetres. And Phil will figure out the uh, circumference from that. This one, maybe 80 centimetres. The, the thing is, like, you know, I'm in a fortunate position as well. I'm in Scotland and there's a company near here called uh, GB Audio. And they've got a lot of these sizes of belt and they do a guarantee where if a belt is the wrong size, you get one swap for a different size at no cost. So, you know, if I'm really stuck, I can buy what I think is an appropriate size and if it still doesn't work, I get one three exchange to make sure that the, what, the belt that ends up at is the correct size. A lot of my audiences in the United States, I don't know about whether there are suppliers that have that same kind of try before buy a facility but that would seem to be a good thing so that's what you want to look out for so if you if you know of a supplier like that united states canada other places where people might be watching this video let me know in the comments okay let's get this uh, oh Christ. let's get this back on on there like that this needs to be trapped into that space like that and then that screw will go in there. This black piece of plastic fits on there, like there's a little tab here that goes into that hole. And then I can screw in a little brass screw into there. I just want to see whether this meter is ascending. I mean, when that take up reel is turning, you see how the uh, meter is, is turning as well. So I think actually the belt tension there is, an, is okay. So I'm gonna leave that in and see how we get on. I'm trying to put this back together at the moment. Generally speaking, I don't know if it's a matter of unfamiliarity on my part, like I work a lot more with Tascam. I do find the Fostec stuff a little bit more awkward to go together um, but I'll just point out the main things that I was kind of struggling with quite a few like longish cables like say this one here and so you need to be careful about where they go back together and I mean I had to go look at my own video footage as reference there so for the instance this one you know it's meant to be tucked down here but there's another long cable that we unwrapped earlier and it starts in this corner and it ends up at this corner and uh, basically, if that doesn't run underneath this board, that's not going to shut. Um, same thing here, there's a long yellow cable here and that must be underneath or it's not really going to shut. So yeah, there's just like issues with like, there's a few of these longer cables that are soldered at both ends or only plug in at one end. You have to be kind of careful about where they're folded lengths, whether they're going underneath this mixer board or on top of it. One of the things I did, really this is just held down with one screw here. Um, this little plug that I said earlier I thought was to do with leaf switches here, and this plug that's to do with the motor coming from here. So I got so far with putting this far down and I found that the plugs uh, that is the connectors were underneath here, so I had to lift it up again and get those and plug them into the sockets, that is headers. And so really any time you're reassembling one of these for the first time, um, it can be quite a daunting process like that. I hope those tips help you. This brings us to the end of today's video about the teardown, but uh, it's not the last that you're going to see of this X26 on this channel. 
after the footage that you just saw, had a couple of teething issues with the audio. Um, I deal with that by partially recapping this unit. One of the things that's missing in this footage up to the point you're watching now is um, I don't locate where the trim pots are. You'll see me do the calibration in the forthcoming video. Don't see me remove the bottom board. That's going to be in a forthcoming video because it, whoop, <laughs> stands dropping again. Obviously, um, I have to remove the bottom board in order to replace a couple of the capacitors. Another thing that comes up that's interesting is the way that this mixer works. It's actually possible to have no input feedback. So that's probably gonna be the subject of its own video where I'm sort of like using this to generate tones in a kind of noise artist sort of way. And then finally, before I flog this for money, on uh, UK eBay. I'm going to do a little demo recording on it and uh, that's going to be a tribute to the Moomins soundtrack. I mean, I don't know if anyone else uh, is aware of uh, this kind of really weird stop motion adaptation of a uh, Finnish fairy tale that was on British television in the 80s, but it had a very uh, distinctive soundtrack. Um, so I'm going to use that as a sort of jumping off point to make up um, some music and record it on there. So yeah, you're going to see at least three more videos of this, as, um, four actually, because I'll do a review as well. So all that remains to say is if you got value out of this video, it does help me to propel my little tattooed hands holding my little soldering iron and my uh, screwdriver into the public content. Consciousness. If you like and subscribe, and dare I say it, turn on the notifications, the little bell icon besides the subscribe icon, leave a comment, leave a question, all of these things make me look good to the algorithm. Um, if you got help fixing this unit or another unit because of what I've done, be aware that I do have a PayPal donate button on my blog, which contains a lot of like free download manuals. I'll be including the ma user manual and service manual for this up there. They're not already up there. They'll be up there soon. The Patreon account, I try and make it really cheap. It's like a pound a month, like a dollar a month. And you do get some exclusive footage there, which is going to be of particular use to anyone who's like deep in the hobby and using this almost like a side hustle. So anyway, uh, if there's anything you would like to know that you don't think I covered in this video, get at me in the comments, ask me some questions. All the links I mentioned are available in the video description. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.